Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve and a brand new inspiring series entitled, The Greatest of These is Love. Do you struggle with pride, selfishness, or anger? Learn how real love can help. In this message, there is no I in love. First Corinthians 13 is a well-known chapter in the Bible. We call it the love chapter because the theme of the chapter, just 13 verses, but the theme of the chapter is love. And that's something that the Corinthians were really missing in their church, and it was causing all kinds of problems. But you know, when you think about the concept of love, if somebody were to ask you today, hey, what is love? love. How would you answer that question? It's kind of a difficult question when you think about it. Somebody took the time to poll some kids, some young kids, ages four to seven, to ask them, hey kids, what is love? Mary Ann, who is only four years old, said this, love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him alone all day. I, I remember Dr. Shields in our church, he's in heaven now, he told me, he said, Jeff, I think God created dogs to teach us about unconditional love. And I think that might be true. Noel, age seven, said this, what is love? Love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. <laughs> Ladies, we will do that if you tell us something like that. Uh, Tommy, age six, said this, love is like a little old man and a little old woman who are still friends even after they know each other so well. That's very sweet. Chris, age seven, said this, love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he's more handsome than Brad Pitt. <laughs> Lauren, age four, I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> I think her older sister told her, this is real love right here. And Nikki said this, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you hate. Uh, kind of uh, crash course in loving. Foreigner, the musical group, sings the song, I want to know what love is. Most of us don't really know what love is. And you know what's interesting? The Bible doesn't really define love as much it, as it describes love and depicts, depicts love. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul is focusing in on love. Now remember, the Corinthians are having uh, all sorts of problems. They're having problems with jealousy and strife and pride and sexual immorality. The church is rife with problems. And the main problem that they're having is they're not practicing love. They're not loving one another. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, the Greeks had four main words for love. They had the word eros. Eros is erotic love, romantic love. When you ask somebody about uh, what is love, they, they kind of go to the love between a, a man and a woman, just kind of naturally go to romantic love. Well, that's the word eros. Eros is not used in the Bible. We have other words in the Greek for love. Storge is another word for love. Storge is family love. That's, that's kind of tight. You know, I, I love my family. And most, for most of us, that's just a natural thing. Then you have phileo. Phileo is brotherly love. And uh, then you have the word that's used over and over and over and over again in the Bible, and that's agape love. That's the highest kind of love. That's a love without conditions. I, I love you not because you do this. I love you not if you do this. I love you in spite of the things that you do. That's how God loves us, and that's how God commands us to love him and to love other people. 
So Paul is really rebuking the Corinthians because they're not exhibiting love. And he told them in the first three verses, hey, love is primary. If you don't have love, you guys are all excited about your spiritual gifts. And he talks about spiritual gifts in chapter 12 and in chapter 14. And right sandwiched in the middle is this discussion on love. And he's saying, I don't care what kind of spiritual gift you have. If you don't have love, it amounts to nothing. And he says these three, three things. He says, without love, I have nothing I am nothing, I gain nothing. Love is primary. And then he goes on in verse 4 and following to describe love. This is what he says. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And he sums up and says, love never fails. So if you take all those things together, 15 from verses 4, 5, and 6, 15 different attributes and characteristics of love. And interesting, we read in the English, these are adjectives. In the Greek, they're verbs. I have a friend of mine who's in heaven now, John Masano. He's preached in our, at our church um, in years past. And he wrote a book called Love is Something You Do. Because love is love when you put it into action. So we want to look this morning at this agape love that Paul talks about, and look at those first three attributes. So, attribute number one, agape love is long-suffering. Love is patient. The Greek word for patient is the Greek word, compound Greek word, macrothumio. Macro means long. I remember when I was at the University of Texas, um, I had to take macroeconomics. And then the next semester, I took microeconomics. Macroeconomics is is the big picture view of economics, and micro is the smaller view. So macro means big, means long, and thumio means anger. It means when you're patient, it takes a long time for you to get angry. It's a love that is slow to anger, and it's a love that patiently endures hardships and hard people, hard to love people, hardships and hard heads. We deal with folks like that, that that are hard people. They're just hard to love. And so love is patient with those people. Now, that is God's love. And, and everything that Paul says about love as he describes love, remember this, it's a picture of God because God is love. God is agape. And Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this is a, a picture and a depiction of the Lord Jesus Christ. And right off the bat, love is patient because the Lord is patient. Now, when Debbie and I went to Branson, we uh, saw the presentation of Noah at the Sights and Sounds Theater. And uh, if you ever get an opportunity to see that, I know some of you have seen it. It is excellent. But in, in the presentation of Noah, it picks up in Genesis chapter 6 how uh, the world is wicked beyond belief. And, And the Bible says that God is grieved in his heart because every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. And God said, I'm gonna have to destroy man from the face of the earth. And the scripture says that even though it was so bad, God says, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, Genesis 6, 3, yet his days shall be 100 and 20 years. Isn't that amazing? 
I mean, if you're at the end of your rope with somebody, I mean, you're God, and you see that every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually, and you say, I'm not going to mess with you anymore. I'm not going to plead with you anymore, but I'm going to give you some time. How about 120 seconds? And I'll give you 120 seconds to get right. Otherwise, I'm bringing destruction. God is slow to anger. And he gave them 120 years, even though they didn't repent. Just Noah and his family were the only ones that went on the ark. And the Bible clearly says that in the book of 1 Peter, that the patience of God was waiting in the days of Noah. But nobody responded. God is long-suffering. When the Lord revealed himself to Moses, Moses said, Lord, Exodus 33, show me your glory. And the Lord said, well, I'll show you the backside of my glory, and I'll make all my goodness pass before you. And he did that with Moses, and he hid him in the cleft of the rock, and he covered him with his hand, and then he passed by, and he declared his name, the Lord, the Lord, God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some men count slowness, but is patient, the Bible says, toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance." Sometimes we say, how come it's been so long since Jesus was on the earth? He said he'd come again, but it's been 2,000 years. Why is God so slow? The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some men count slowness. He's patient toward you because he doesn't want you to perish. I got saved in 1980. If Jesus had come back in 1979, I would have missed it. I would have missed out on it. I would have to have gone through the great tribulation. Who knows if I would have gotten saved then. But he didn't. He was patient toward me. And so regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation. God is a patient God. Robert Ingersoll was the well-known atheist. And uh, he just hated the idea of God. He was speaking one time to a crowd. And he said, "Uh, I, I call God out if God exists then I call him out right now. God, if you exist, then strike me dead right now. I will give you five minutes. And he set his watch and he said, let's just wait and see if God shows up, if there is a God. And he waited five minutes and nothing happened. And he laughed and he said, see, there is no God. Well, a Christian heard of this stunt that he pulled and he said, how foolish that Robert Ingersoll could possibly think that he could exhaust the patience of God in five minutes. God is long-suffering. God is patient. And when you and I are patient, we're like God. So that agape love is patient. It's a love that is slow to anger, that patiently endures. It's a love that cuts people lots of slack. Do you do that? In your relationships with people, do you do that? In the relationships with your own family, do you cut them lots of slack? So often we don't. So often we're so impatient with people. We're impatient with people at work. We're impatient with people in the neighborhood. We're impatient with people on the road. We're impatient with people at home. A little boy named Timmy was just a first, second grader, just a little guy. And uh, his mother was called to his school to have a conference with Timmy's teacher because Timmy was struggling in some things. And so the teacher wanted to talk to Timmy's mother about things. And so she went to the school and, and the teacher began to tell, well, Tim, Timmy's, you know, he's having a little bit of trouble here and he's having a little bit of trouble there. And, and uh, I have to get on to him a little bit. And, and the teacher said to the mother, she said, but you know what? He said something to me today that I didn't understand. Maybe you understand what it means. He kept saying that love is slow. She said, I I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? And the mother burst out in tears. And the mother said, I know what that means. She said, it's so busy in the morning at our household, and, and Timmy always seems to be dragging, and I always say, Timmy, hurry up, Timmy, hurry up, Timmy, get out of bed, Timmy, hurry up, eat your breakfast, Timmy, hurry up, Timmy, brush your teeth, hurry up, Timmy, uh, uh, get dressed, hurry up, hurry up, put on your jacket, put on your shoes, tie your shoes, hurry up, hurry, hurry, and she said, this morning, I just got so angry with him that I just yelled at him and said, Timmy, why are you so slow? 
She said, that's why he's saying that. Love is slow. Love is patient. Love is long-suffering with people. And see, that word macrothumio, it means that you can retaliate, but you don't retaliate because that's a love that waits patiently for the Lord. We wait on the Lord when we practice patience. The Scripture says, be patient until the coming of the Lord. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone, but respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So when we're patient, we're patient until the coming of the Lord. We don't retaliate even though we could because love is patient. It is long-suffering. Second attribute, agape love, not only is it patient and long-suffering, it is kind and gracious. Kind and gracious. Love is patient. Verse 4, love is kind. That word for kind is also a word that Jesus used when he said in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. It is kind. It is gracious. And my burden is light. Kindness is so critical. It is so important. When my girls were little, I said, we're, we're going to have a scripture that is going to be the scripture for our home. Ephesians 4.32. And be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. It's important for kids to be kind to one another. Now, I had three girls, and I think girls are great. Girls rock. But girls are, when they're good, they're great. When they're bad, they're horrible. Can I get an amen, somebody? I mean, uh, there's a reason why there's a television show called Mean Girls. They don't have mean boys, I don't think. It's just mean girls. Boys, they just go out and fight. But girls pick each other to death. Uh, they can be just so catty. And uh, you, you might remember the poem, there was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, she was very, very good. And when she was bad, she was horrid. That's the way girls are. When they're good, they're great. When they're bad, they're terrible. And so we had with the girls, hey, Ephesians 4.32, family verse, be kind to one another. See, kindness treats others with respect. 1 Corinthians 13.5 says, that love does not act unbecomingly. Love is not rude. Love treats others with respect. Now, remember, the Lord says, if there's not love there, whatever you're doing, you, you have nothing, you are nothing, you gain nothing, nothing on eternity's clock. And so we're supposed to be respectful of other people, and we don't treat them like they're some kind of second-class person. Now, interesting, so patience is I take from you. I could retaliate, but I choose not to retaliate because love is long-suffering. Kindness is what you give in return. See, uh, it, it's kind of like the, the two sides of the same coin. So on one side, love says, I will take from you and I'll be long-suffering with you and I'll be patient with you. And on the other side, instead of retaliating against you, I'm going to give you kindness, that which you do not deserve. See, kindness gives a blessing and not an insult. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, to sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, 
and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you are called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Don't, don't return insult for insult. Have you noticed how we just naturally, if somebody gets you, that you just want to get them back? I remember uh, we used to watch in our family the movie Hook with Robin Williams. And, uh, the, you know, they're at, the, they're at the dinner table. If you saw that movie, you know, it's the Peter Pan thing. But it, it's done a little differently. Anyway, they're at the table, and uh, Rufio is, is giving uh, Robin Williams what for, and he's coming up with all these uh, cut downs and insults. And they're like, come on, hit him back, hit him back. He's throwing it at you, you throw it at him. Well, that's kind of the world's way. If somebody insults you, you, you go one up on them. You know, it's kind of like playing catch with your friend. I was, I was the youngest of three brothers. And uh, so if I played catch with Larry or Greg, you know, they could throw the ball harder than I could. And so we're just throwing, you know, playing catch. You throw it to me, I throw it to you. You throw it to me, I throw it to you. You know, you got your glove on. And all of a sudden, if he comes hard, well, then it's like, okay, my manhood is, is on the line here. I got to come harder. And he comes harder, I got to come harder. And we do that so often in relationships, so often in marriage. And in the, the closest person to us, she says something we don't like, so we come back with something to get her, and then she comes back to get us. And it's insult for insult. The Bible says don't do that. Give a blessing instead. A gentle answer, Proverbs 15, 1, turns away, turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I was speaking, Debbie and I were speaking at a family life conference uh, some years ago, and one of the guys that we were speaking with told a story about uh, taking his wife and his young son, I think he was about four or five years old, to Disneyland. They lived in, in the Anaheim, California area, and so they went to Disneyland, and they were building the Disneyland up to their little boy, saying, oh, this is going to be great. You're going to love this, all the different things at Disneyland. And then, and then at the end, there's a big fireworks show. And so that's going to be like the cherry on the Sunday. And so the little kid was so excited. So they get there, and, you know, they had to park, uh, you know, in a different time zone, and, you know, how it is at those places. And so walking and walking and walking. And uh, they had a stroller for him because they knew, hey, this is going to be a lot of walking. He can't do all that. So they had a stroller for him. Well, so they spent the day at Disneyland. They did all the fun stuff. And then it's coming down to the evening and the fireworks, and their little boy falls asleep. And, I mean, he's out. And so my friend Ty tells his wife, said, listen, I've, I've had all the fun I want to have. You know how it is for, especially for dads, uh, with going to a place like that. So they're like, Let, let's just go. He's asleep and I don't need to see the fireworks. And so let's go. So they packed everything up and they go back to the car. And when they get all the way back to the car and he pulls his son out to put him in the car seat, the little boy wakes up. And the little boy wants to know about the fireworks. And his dad said, well, that ship sailed, son. Uh, you know, because uh, you fell asleep and so we didn't get to see the fireworks. And, and, you know, it's just too late, it's too far. And the little boy starts to scream and he starts to carry on and he starts to cry and it gets loud. And the father's getting, I mean, the long suffering is going out the window. And uh, then his wife says to him, uh, Ty, we could just go back and we could put him in the stroller and we could get back in there. They'd probably let us in. We wouldn't have to pay again. And let's just do it. And then uh, he just hits his breaking point and he snaps at her. And he says some ugly things to her. He doesn't cuss at her or anything like that, but he's just rude to her. And he's just very curt and demeaning. He was insulting. And you know how that works where somebody does that to you and your natural inclination has come back to him. And so he was insulting to her, and she looked at him, and she looked deeply into his eyes, and she said, Ty, I love you. Thank you for taking us here. I know this has been hard, but thank you for doing that. And he said his heart just melted when he saw his wife just being so sweet to him. It was undeserved. He was being a jerk. And he just, oh, he said, oh, let's go. Let's get him back in the stroller. Let's go. <laughs> you know, we, we need to do this. And, but it made all the difference in the world. A gentle answer turns away wrath. 
but a harsh word stirs up anger. Love is kind and gracious, even when people don't deserve it. Listen, you know, I have a, a heart for wait staff when I go out to eat. I always like to engage the waiter or waitress. I like to find out a little bit about them. I always like to give them a good tip. I always like to bless them. Sometimes you have a really good waiter or waitress. Sometimes you have one that's not so great. But they still need to be treated with kindness. And you know what's so bad is that so many waiters and waitresses don't like to work on Sundays because they know the Christians are coming for lunch. And the Christians can be so rude and so demeaning and so demanding. Hey, love is kind and love is gracious. And we need to be that way. And then thirdly, kindness does not go off on people. Agape love is kind and gracious, and kindness doesn't go off on people. Now, here's what I want you to think of going off on people, because we've all done it before, where you hit, you hit the, the breaking point like my friend Ty did. He went off on his wife and his son. We've all done that before. But here's where you really need to watch it so that you don't go off. Two words, you need to write it down, social media. People go off on other people on social media. Have you noticed that? I mean, things just ramp up real fast on social media. I mean, you, you put a picture of your puppy on there and say, I like puppies. And then somebody comes back and says, you racist. I mean, it's just like, how is that a racist? I like puppies, you know. And so you come back with something on them. Oh, yeah, your mother wears army boots, you know, and you get the mothers involved. And it just seems to escalate so quickly. Be kind to one another. Now, this is the way I look at social media. I, I do two main social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter. And uh, Instagram, I have an Instagram account, but I hadn't figured out how to use that one yet. But uh, I still remember uh, Chris Schroeder's daughter, Brooklyn, she's right down front there. We were talking one day because she does Instagram, and we were comparing Instagrams, and she goes, well, you have more friends than I do. You have more followers on Instagram than I do. I said, well, I never go on it. Maybe that's how you get them. You know, you don't, you don't ever show up. <laughs> but listen, Facebook especially, that's like inviting people into your living room, your page on Facebook. And that's true for, that's the way I look at it. I think other people look at it like that. You're supposed to be my quote-unquote friend. I have 5,000 friends on Facebook. I probably don't know 4,500 of them, you know? I mean, it's just like when I first got on there, it's like, okay, you want to be my friend? Yes, 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 yes. Don't know who you are. People quit me all the time. So if you want to be my friend on Facebook, just get in line because sure enough, there would be five or six quit next week. Uh, because I post things on there, not directed at anyone in particular, but at ideologies, at the issue of abortion, religious liberty, uh, biblical morality, those kinds of things, and people get mad. But can you imagine going into somebody's house and, and sitting down in their living room and just start blasting them about their stand on this and that and the other? We wouldn't do that face to face. But boy, we think we can do it online. And I had one guy, he was blasting me about something. It's like, I haven't heard from you in 15 years, and you show up on my Facebook page blasting me about this. Could you at least say, hello, how are you doing? And then blast me, at least be <laughs> nice about it. You know, and it's just, we got to be careful with that kind of stuff. Because why? Love is kind. And by this, all men will know that we are his disciples if we have love for one another. So agape love is long-suffering. Agape love is kind and gracious. And attribute number three, agape love is not jealous of other people. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Now, in the Corinthian church, lots of jealousy. And lots of jealousy as it related to spiritual gifts because they, they put so much emphasis on the more showy gifts, especially speaking in tongues. 
And they're like, oh, man, uh, I wish I had that gift. And, and people were getting up and speaking, and people were no doubt, and the devil was involved in that, no doubt, corrupting that gift because some people were cursing Jesus supposedly in this tongue. And people had, I have this gift, you just have this lower gift. And they were doing all that kind of stuff. And there was jealousy and strife in the church. And Paul says, hey, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous. Now, the Bible tells us about jealousy in James chapter 3. It says this, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Man, jealousy is a bad player. Because when that exists, there's disorder and every evil thing. There was jealousy in the church. Paul says to them in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, hey, I wanted to speak to you as mature men in Christ, but I couldn't because you're jealous of one another. And there's selfish ambition running around in the church. And so I had to talk to you like baby Christians. And I couldn't give you solid food. I had to give you milk because you weren't able to take it. Uh, you were just mere men. You're just acting like you're not even saved. So when you think about this thing called jealousy, how, how does that come about? Well, jealousy is rooted in two things, comparison and covetousness. Comparison and covetousness. See, you, you, when you, if you lived all by yourself in, a, in an island somewhere in a different planet, and it's just you There'd be no, you wouldn't be jealous because it's just you. So who are you going to be jealous of? But we don't, we, we live with other people. And so jealousy comes when you start comparing. Now the Bible tells us that we should count our blessings. We have a song, count your blessings, name them one by one, count your many blessings, see what God has done. And what we tend to do is we'll look at our blessings but we don't count them as much as we like to compare them. How many blessings do I have versus how many blessings does this guy have, this girl have, and we compare. How am I doing compared to this person? Now, if you're a naturally competitive person, I'm naturally competitive, that can make it hard because you, you, you kind of line up, and if you're in a competitive field, you kind of do that. But hey, in the Christian life, you can't start comparing what God has done in your life versus what God has done in somebody else's life. Because if you do that, when you compare, two things happen. One of two things will happen. Both of them are bad. If you compare and you are doing better than your neighbor, you get proud. Well, look at me. Ah, my list of blessings is two pages. Yours is just a half a page. I'm doing really well. You know, my son's a doctor. My daughter's on the Supreme Court. My uh, other son is, is a bank president. Well, my kid works at Whopper, Whataburger. You know, I mean, it's just kind of like, well, uh, it's not so good there. Uh, nothing wrong with Whataburger, but, you know, you compare. And so it'll make you proud. Or if you end up on the short side of the stick, it makes you depressed. You're like, well, I mean, why does she get everything? Why is she so pretty and I'm not as pretty? Why is he so talented and I'm not as talented? Why, why does he get the, the, the big promotion and I didn't get the big promotion? And we compare and then we start to covet. Now, and commandment number 10 on the two tablets of stone. You shall not covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's spouse or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You be thankful and grateful for what God has given you. And you don't look at your neighbor and you don't compare your neighbor. You know, when Jesus was talking to Peter in John chapter 21, and he told him, uh, this is what's going to happen to you, Peter. There's coming a day where they're going to lead you to a place where you don't want to go. And uh, bad things are going to happen. He was speaking to him about his death. And Peter was like, okay, Lord. And then he points to John. He said, well, Lord, what about this guy? And Jesus said, what is that to you? What does my plan for John have to do with you? Peter, you follow me. 
Don't get your eyes on John. Don't compare your life with John's, your ministry with John. You follow me. So jealousy comes. You compare and then you covet. You want what the other person has. And then it goes deeper. Jealousy is often characterized by resentment. See, James 3 talks about bitter jealousy. Bitter jealousy. That's a jealousy that's rooted in resentment. It's not so much that I hate that you have this and I don't have this. It's not only do I want what you have, but I don't want you to have it. See, it's bitter jealousy. We have that when people commit terrible crimes against another. If you remember Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding, they, they, were, they were bitter rivals, and most of the bitterness, from all I can tell, came from Tanya Harding. And she looked at Nancy Kerrigan like, you, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth, and you're better uh, than I am at skating, and so uh, we're going to fix your wagon. I'm going to get somebody to hit you with a lead pipe in your knee, and then you're not going to be able to skate anymore, and then I can take the limelight. Bitter jealousy causes all kinds of problems. You know, some of the worst for jealousy, some of the worst for jealousy, preachers, it's just true. Preachers get together at conferences, and we're comparing. How's your church doing? And we're constantly thinking about our church. We hang around this guy. It's like, how many are your church? Oh, we got 300. Oh, well, why don't you ask me how many are at my church? Because I have more than 300. And then you get by somebody, how many at your church? Oh, I have 3,000. Oh, well, why don't you go over there, you know, because you have more than I do. And, and so we're constantly doing that kind of stuff. You know, there were two very famous preachers in the early 1900s, of first half of the 1900s in Texas, who were so jealous and such bitter enemies. One was George W. Truett. He was the pastor at First Baptist Dallas for 40 some odd years. And the other was J. Frank Norris. He was the pastor at First Baptist Fort Worth. And he was there for 40 some odd years. Many of us know in Baptist circles, we know George W. Truett a lot better than we know the name J. Frank Norris. Well, during the 20s and 30s, people knew J. Frank Norris much better. And here's the reason why. He was indicted four times by a county grand jury, once for perjury, twice for arson, and then once for first degree murder. Somebody came to his office, and as the story goes, he confronted J. Frank Norris, and it got physical, and J. Frank Norris pulled a gun out of his desk and shot and killed him. Well, that's pretty severe. I've had some people come and confront me at my office, but I never thought, hey, here's an idea. I, I've never done that. Now, he was acquitted, and they said it was self-defense, but still, that's, that's really something. So he was in the news a lot. J. Frank Norris. Well, he couldn't stand George W. Truett. So much so that he would send him telegrams in the early hours on Sunday morning so it would interrupt his sleep. So he would wake up and then couldn't go back to sleep. He would send telegrams to the church on Sunday morning and time it in such a way it was before he got up to preach and he would get this telegram somehow in Truett's hands that says, I can't believe that you would occupy a pulpit because of the kind of person you are. You are an infidel. He just went off on him. But there was such bitterness there. There was such jealousy there. They were jealous of each other's ministries and I don't know how much of that was coming from Truett but a lot of it was coming from J. Frank Norris. Preachers can be the worst when it comes to jealousy. Hey, love is not jealous. And maybe you're here and you struggle with jealousy. Maybe you've been jealous of a sister or a brother or your neighbor or somebody on the ball team because they're better than you are. Hey, you're going to always meet people that are better than you are. Better in business, better in sports, better this, better that, better looking. It just, there's just people around like that. You just got to be comfortable in your own skin. This is how God made me. I'm going to be the best me I can be. I'm not in competition with anybody else. I'm in competition with myself to be the best me I can be. 
And when you let bitter jealousy get in your heart, it brings every evil thing. I ran across a story that's a fable about two eagles. And one eagle was a better flyer than the other eagle. And the one that was the lesser flyer, he didn't like that, that his counterpart could go higher and faster than he could. And so he found a sportsman one day, and he said to the sportsman, he said, you see that eagle up in the sky? He said, why don't you take your bow and arrow and shoot him down? And the sportsman said, well, I, I could, but now I need a feather for my arrow. And so the bitter eagle said, well, here, take one of mine. And he pulled out a feather for him to put on his arrow, and he went and shot, but he missed the soaring eagle. So he said, I need another feather. And so the eagle says, sure, take another one. And he does it, and he shoots, and he misses. And he says, take another one, take another one, take another one. He kept shooting and kept missing. And finally, the eagle said, okay, that's all the feathers I can give you. But he had given so many feathers, he could no longer fly. And the sportsman turned and killed him. See, jealousy doesn't hurt the person who is soaring. It hurts you. It hurts you. And love is not jealous. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying, wait a minute, time out. You say that 1 Corinthians 13 is a picture of Jesus. Yes. And that love is not jealous. Yes. But Jeff, I think I've read somewhere in the Bible that says that God is jealous. Yes, you did. Exodus 34, verse 14, for you shall not worship any other God for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. God is a jealous God. You say, well, it says the love is not jealous and God is a jealous God. How do you reconcile those things? Well, you reconcile them this way. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Paul told the Corinthians, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. See, here's the thing. When we are jealous, we are jealous of another person. God is never jealous of you. He's jealous for you. Because God knows that the thing you need is him. And so he's jealous for you to follow after him, to come to him, to walk with him. He jealously desires the spirit whom he has given to us to, to dwell in us and to dominate us. God has that desire for you and for me. God is a jealous God. He's jealous for you, not jealous of you. Now, I want to close with this story. I ran across this story years ago. It's a story written by a lady named Mary Ann Bird. Mary Ann Bird was born with many physical deformities and difficulties. She was deaf in one ear. She had some deformities in her face. She, her speech was garbled. She got made fun of mercilessly as a kid growing up, as you can imagine. She was growing up in the 40s and 50s. And people were just brutal to her. And Mary Ann Bird just said, you know, I think the only person who's ever going to love me is just family because everybody else out there in the world, they don't seem to love me. They just make fun of me. They just constantly tease me because I'm different. Well, one year in her grammar school years, she was put in Mrs. Leonard's class. And Mrs. Leonard was different than all the other teachers because she was just so happy and so joyful and so warm and had a great smile and seemed to love people. Well, one day, they had a hearing test in their school. That's what they would do back then. Uh, you didn't have special, you know, equipment for that. They would just have hearing tests in the class, and the teacher would call the student up, and the teacher would say, now, you hold, cover up one ear, and I'm going to whisper in this ear, and then you tell me what I whispered, and then we're going to cover up the other ear, and I'll whisper, and you tell me what I whispered. And the teacher would normally whisper something like, the sky is blue, the grass is green, what color are your, sh your shoes, just stuff like that, just kind of generic stuff. But when 
Marianne Bird was called up to the teacher. She said she always cheated because she was deaf in one ear, so she would pretend to hold her hand over her ear, but she would cup it so she could hear with her good ear when the teacher was whispering in the bad ear because she didn't want to be made more fun of by the students. And she said, when I came up to the front, she said, Mrs. Leonard did something that changed my life. She didn't whisper in my ear, the sky is blue or the grass is green. She whispered these seven words. I wish you were my little girl. I wish you were my little girl. Mary Ann Bird said that was like the first time somebody had just deposited love like that outside of her family into her heart. I've never forgotten that story because that's exactly what God does. He's jealous for you. He wishes that you would be his son, his daughter, his child. He gave his only begotten son so that you would not perish, but that you could have eternal life. The Father did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he says to everyone, I wish you belonged to me. I wish you were mine. Listen, you might be here today and you've never made a decision to give your heart and life to Christ. I want you to hear from the Lord the whisper test. I wish you were mine. I wish you would come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. I will forgive your sin. I will change your life. Come to me. And for the believers, those who have come to him, the Lord still says, hey, I want you to walk with me. I want you to walk in my love. The problem that we have in church for many of us is we know the truth, we know the gospel, we've responded to the gospel, but now we're just kind of coasting. We're not really seeking the Lord. And the Lord said, I wish you would seek me with all your heart. I wish you would walk with me. I jealously desire my spirit to dwell within you and to dominate you so that I could fill you with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. A person would have to be a fool to say to God, no God, I think I'll just go it on my own. My friend, the greatest of these is love. And God so loved the world, he so loved you, that he gave his only begotten son. If you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus, I wanna encourage you to do that today. Just pray this prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. Lord, right now I surrender my all to you. Come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please call me, write me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. Thank you for watching From His Heart Today, the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth.